The Holy Gospel according to John, the 15th chapter. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. I was reading a biblical commentary as part of my preaching preparation this week, and I loved this cheeky comment from New Testament scholar Caroline Lewis. She says, one of the primary characteristics of biblical preaching is that the Bible is actually read. I know, a novel idea, right? She was referencing some preacher's choice to proclaim a message of hell and damnation out of these eight verses from John. What with all their talk of branches being cut off from the vine and thrown into the fire and burned. Some of us, preachers included, were taught from a very young age that our primary job as Christians is to be good, good enough to escape hell. And that God's primary job as God is to save good people and damn the rest. If that's what we've learned about God and the Christian life, then it's easy to sift that message out of this passage from John. The problem is that such a message doesn't fit at all with how this gospel writer understands God or life in a community of faith. In order to understand them, we need to put these verses into the larger context of John's gospel, which isn't at all about hell and damnation. It's about abiding relationship, the abiding relationship that Jesus has with God, the abiding relationship that we have with Jesus, and the abiding relationship that we have with each other in Christ. The verses we just heard are part of a four-chapter-long section of John that is sometimes called Jesus' farewell discourse. These chapters unfold in the upper room where Jesus is spending time with his friends on the night before his crucifixion. Through poignant words and loving actions, Jesus is preparing his friends for his death, for the rapidly approaching time when he will no longer be with them. It's super tender for all of them. Leaving is hard. The disciples are imperfect and short-sighted and self-serving sometimes, just like we are. And Jesus loves them fiercely. He knows that their lives will be turned completely upside down after he dies. He knows the threats and fears and challenges they will face as they find the holy courage it will take to eventually help the church get born. But I don't even think all of it is quite that meta. I think Jesus is also just going to miss these beloved friends. If leaving is hard, then being left is even harder. The disciples have anchored and oriented their lives around Jesus in the ministry they've shared for three incredible years. As the disciples' hearts and minds slowly open to what Jesus is telling them, that he's going to die, it starts to feel like the once solid earth beneath their feet is starting to crumble. Like branches cut off from a vine, there is a withering feeling that comes with anticipating the sort of goodbye that Jesus is describing. And that anticipation brings a particular kind of fear, a fear of the loss of belonging, a fear of the loss of being needed, a fear of the loss of purpose a fear of the loss of identity, 
a fear of change. Well, the circumstances are certainly different. It strikes me that this moment in our collective lives isn't all that dissimilar from what the disciples were experiencing in this text from John. Jesus' death will place an indelible before and after in the fabric of the disciples' lives. And as it is with any major life-altering event, there will be an unsettling period between the before and the after in which nobody even knows which end is up. A period that will require the disciples to try and make sense of who they even are anymore, much less to make sense of the work that has been entrusted to them. Church, that's what this pandemic is doing in us. COVID-19 will place an indelible before and after in the fabric of our lives. But right now, we are in that unsettling period between the before and the after, trying to make sense of who we even are anymore, trying to sort through the spiritual, emotional, and relational work that God has put before us. And it's really hard. It's hard on an individual level. I've loved the articles that a few of you have sent me recently where writers are resurrecting words like languishing and acedia, trying to help us all find language to name the disquieting symptoms of this in-between time that so many of us are experiencing. We're having trouble concentrating, even though there's nobody around to interrupt us. We're bored, even though there's a stack of unread books on the end table and endless family and work demands. We're listless, foregoing a walk outside for unchecked hours of phone scrolling. We're lonely, but we don't know what to do when we get together with people. Do we wear our masks if we're vaccinated? Do we not? What do, how do I even be around people anymore? We're anxious or apathetic or stressed without being able to point to anything specific that might be causing these feelings. A close friend and I were talking about this just last week and he was like, I don't know, I feel stressed, but I don't know why. It's just like existential stress, I guess. What do you even do with existential stress? What even is existential stress? He mused with me, hashtag relatable. <laughs> this in-between time is hard on an individual level, but it's also hard on a communal level. It's hard for us here at Grace. This past Wednesday, I shared Grace's spring and summer worship plans with you via my weekly email. We will continue to offer online worship, of course, but this morning we also added a nine o'clock outdoor family-friendly service on the Catherine Lawn. And on Pentecost Sunday, May 23rd, we'll add a limited capacity indoor service, our first indoor worship since March of 2020. Grace leadership has prayerfully and faithfully discerned that these varied worship opportunities are what will best serve the needs of our whole community in this season. But that email and video hadn't been out for more than just a few minutes, and I started to hear from you. Some of you wrote to share your gratitude for how Grace's leadership has guided us through this challenging time. Some of you wrote to share your concern that it's still too early for indoor worship that the risks are still too great. Some of you wrote to share that you're just not ready to share space with other people yet, even though you're fully vaccinated. And a few of you wrote to express your anger, that it's taken us until now to begin indoor worship, or that you'll be required to wear a mask in worship, or that all of our worship isn't happening indoors, or that our indoor worship numbers will be limited that something as benign as three different worship opportunities creates such deep and varied emotional responses is, I think, a clear example of how this in-between time is impacting us. This time between the before COVID and after COVID. The world has changed around us and we've changed too. We instinctively know that there is no going back to life or church exactly as it was before the pandemic. 
but we also can't quite see who will be on the other side of this. And that's scary for a lot of us. But I also firmly believe that it will be life-giving if we can find not just the courage, but also the humility to be open to it. How can I be so sure? Because in this emotionally charged time of rapid change, there is one thing that remains constant, the promise of abiding relationship. Abide in me as I abide in you, Jesus tells us. Like branches on a vine, we are connected to the source of all life that is also connected right back to us. It's not just us hanging on to the vine, it's Jesus holding on to us, remaining with us, dwelling in us, holding us in the tender grasp of grace, no matter what threatens to mow us down. Like branches on a vine, our life together is sometimes tangled, sometimes chaotic, sometimes messy. Sometimes it's painful as we allow things to be pruned out of us that we'd rather not let go of or that no longer serve God's purpose for who we are and for who we will be. But like the tangled, chaotic, messy clematis vine that has begun climbing the trellis in my neighbor's backyard, our life together in Christ is also gorgeous when we give ourselves over to it, spilling over with fruits of love and mercy, patience and generosity, humility and justice, beauty and joy. Let us abide, beloved ones. Amen.